Good morning. This virtual public hearing conducted by the Committee on Economic Development, Agriculture, Power, and Energy Utilities and the Arts is called to order at 9 a.m. Notice of the hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets on December 9th of 2021 with the second notice provided on December 14th of 2021. Notice of the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website. This morning, the committee will hear testimony on the appointment of Mr. Michael A. Pangolinan as a member of the Public Utilities Commission. Upon conclusion of Mr. Pangolinan's confirmation hearing, we'll take a five minute recess before we hear testimony on the appointment of Mr. Al Edrich LeBang as a youth member to the board of directors of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. Before we proceed with hearing testimonies, I'd like to provide the panel participants with some general rules of conduct before, uh, for this virtual public hearing. All participants must abide by the rules of conduct and quality assurance standards, including the chair will invite individuals who have signed up to testify. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name, title, and organization for record purposes. Please ensure that you are unmuted and that you are speaking clearly into your microphone. For group settings where more than one individual is present, please state your name before providing comment. From among the panel of senators, each member will be allowed to pose one question to an individual testifying for one round and be provided another round if necessary. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this rule of conduct will result in removal from the meeting by the room host. I would now like to welcome my colleagues who have joined us this morning, uh, Senator Tony Ada and Senator Tello Taidegui. Thank you for joining us and good morning. We'll now proceed with discussions on the appointment of Mr. Michael A. Pangolinan as a member of the Public Utilities Commission. And we'll begin by hearing testimony from those who have joined us today and I'll call on participants and based on the order of how they signed in. So first on the sign-in sheet this morning is Mr. Fred Harecki. Thank you, Chairman Rigel, uh, Senators Ada and Chaitagui. My name is Fred Harecki. I'm the Chief Administrative Law Judge for the Guam Public Utilities Commission. A written testimony has been submitted by our Chairman, uh, Jeff Johnson. So I will be presenting his testimony this morning. Uh, Chairman Johnson is strongly in support of the confirmation of uh, Mike Pangolinan to another term with the Guam Public Utilities Commission. It should first be pointed out that uh, Mr. Pangolinan has previously already served two terms, and those are six year terms for the members of the PUC. So he is a very experienced member. He is entirely familiar with the procedures and the workings of the Public Utilities Commission. So certainly it uh, greatly assists the commission to continue to have someone of his great experience to serve with the commission. Uh, Chairman Johnson has characterized Mr. Pangolinan as a very dedicated and hardworking member of the commission who has faithfully attended the uh, commission meetings and also participated in training and workshops. Mike brings particular skills, of course, as an attorney. And many of the uh, functions that the PUC undertakes are the review of contracts, that is larger contracts of the utilities. There's usually a dollar amount involved. For a GPA, the PUC reviews any contract in excess of 1.5 million. Uh, for the Port Authority, it's 1 million. For GWA, it's 1 million. In those reviews, it is inevitable that uh, procurement issues come up. Now, the PUC is not, uh, per se, a procurement board, but normally the PUC, in reviewing these contracts, at least, least tries to make sure on a facial basis that, that the procurement procedures were followed. And that is an area that uh, Commissioner Pangolinan is extremely strong in. He's very familiar with all the procedures for procurement of the government, as well as all the uh, particular rules 
and procedures that uh, bind the government, such as open government law, sunshine law. So uh, he has always been very helpful in analyzing contracts, another skill of an attorney, and that is something that's very important for the contract review. So he has contributed greatly to the contract review process of the uh, commission. He also has brought that same insight and um, observation into the commission's procurements and always to make sure that the letter of the law is followed. And uh, that is a very helpful, necessary perspective for a I guess you'd say a quasi-judicial body such as the PUC to have. Um, he has also brought a lot of common sense perspectives to the commission on bond matters, for example. I know he's asked on a number of occasions um, about the expenditure of bond funds, because one thing that happens with the utilities, they will issue bonds, but it takes quite a while normally to uh, expend those bond funds. So he's on occasion question, you know, how are they really always necessary if the expenditures aren't being made? Um, Chairman Johnson has pointed out a particular instance recently where, where Commissioner Pangolin was uh, very helpful for the commission. And I, I think he, Commissioner Pangolin is what, what the chairman would call a voice of moderation. He's always able to look at an issue, to work on a common sense solution, and, and to gain some support with the commissioners. And this was most recently evident with regard to the levelized energy adjustment clause increases. Now, nobody likes increases, right? That, that's the fact. But uh, sometimes when the fuel prices go up, the commission has no choice. And that was recently the case uh, last year at, at the end of July when the LEAC rate was adjusted. And uh, Commissioner Pangolin was instrumental in uh, advocating a three-step increase so that the ratepayers would not be unduly burdened all at once and uh, crafted a solution or an emotion that led to the adoption of a, a more moderated rate increase so at least the ratepayers had some uh, relief from what was an unfortunate but necessary situation. And Commissioner Pangolinen has often served that role, a voice of moderation and a voice of reason. Um, he has always undertaken his PUC duties in a dedicated manner. He's worked uh, diligently as a commissioner and his, his reappointment will I believe really be essential to having a strong, uh, hardworking PUC. And uh, for that reason, Chairman Johnson is extremely strong in his support of the confirmation of Commissioner uh, Pangolinen. And again, it, his reappointment is really essential to ensure that the commission works effectively and continues to uh, carry out its regulatory responsibilities. Uh, finally, Dr. Johnson urges that the committee members all support the confirmation of Commissioner Pankalinen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harecki for your testimony. Uh, next will be the nominee himself, Mr. Pangolinen. You may begin, Mr. Pangolinen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Rigel, Senator Tida Green, Senator Ada. It's always an honor to appear before the Guam legislature. I'm here this morning to request that I once again be allowed to continue serving as a member of the Guam Public Utilities Commission. I was originally appointed by Governor Felix Camacho in 2008, and this is now my third nomination for reappointment. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Governor Leon Guerrero for reappointing me. I'm no longer a rookie on the commission, that's for sure, but I'm always learning more and more about utility rate regulation. I hope you will continue to allow me to serve our island as a PUC commissioner. It's difficult being a PUC commissioner. There's a lot of technical material to digest and process. 
And it's particularly difficult for those of us who do not have an engineering background. It can be quite time consuming, tedious, and the decisions we make as a commission office often upset people. Sometimes our decisions result in rate increases. Island residents and businesses are never happy about that. Sometimes we deny rate increases or deny funding requests from the utilities, which can be frustrating to them. But even though it can be difficult and unpleasant at times, I feel privileged to serve on the PUC and, and proud of the work that we do. The PUC serves an important public function in reviewing utility rates and charges. We also review contracts between the utilities and their vendors and service providers. And the issues that come before us affect the lives of Guam's residents and businesses. It's humbling to be entrusted with that kind of responsibility. And that's a feeling I'm sure all of you good senators know very well. So it's been an honor to serve on the PC, but it's even more of an honor to be asked to continue to serve. We have a very skilled and dedicated support team at the PC, especially our chief ALJ, Fred Arecki, and our ALJs, Joseph, Joe Fettel, Contra, and Anthony Camacho. They guide us through the technical material we must attempt to digest in order to make our decisions on matters brought before us. We have a hardworking administrator, Ms. Lou Palomo, and the new assistant administrator, Cynthia Brown, who prepare our meeting materials and manage the PUC's daily operations. We also have an amazing chairman in Dr. Jeff Johnson. It's, and it's been my real pleasure to work with our two new commissioners, Pedro Guerrero and of course, Doris Flores Brooks, who bring a wealth of experience and technical expertise to the commission. I also wanna say that I appreciate the active role that you have taken Chairman Rigel, providing input to the PUC regarding issues of concern to the people of Guam and monitoring how the PUC has operated during your term as chairman of this committee. Your input and oversight has caused us to step up our game and has improved our performance as a commission. I welcome your continued input and oversight. With the help of our supportive team and some very experienced commissioners, I promise to continue to do my very best to contribute to the function we perform as a commission especially in areas where I'm able to put my own educational background to use. My background is law, not engineering, but I will continue to look for opportunities to develop my, to develop my technical knowledge so I can continue to serve effectively if you decide to approve my renomination. I again thank Governor Leon Guerrero for this renewed opportunity. I thank Chairman Rigel for quickly scheduling this hearing, and I thank all of you senators, both of you senators, for also being here this morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be once again asked to serve. If you decide to allow me to continue to serve as a PUC commissioner, I will do my very best to serve you well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pangolina. Allow me to recognize at this time, uh, Senator Joanne Brown, who's joined us as well. Uh, we'll begin the uh, question uh, and comment portion for my colleagues. And uh, I know in the beginning, as I read the rules, Initially, the rules said for one question per round, but since there's only a few of us here this morning, I'll go ahead and allow you to just ask all of your questions from the first round uh, so we can uh, complete this hearing. Senator Ada, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning again, Mr. Panglinen, Attorney Panglinen, and thank you for uh, once again, you know, stepping up to the plate and uh, um, answering the call to Governor Leon Guerrero's, uh, uh, you know, nomination for uh, the member on the PUC. Uh, it's, it's a long time, and uh, I, I think uh, Fred said it best, you know, and you both of you said it best, that you guys learn to grow, and uh, decisions are not made easily, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, going back and forth, and you know, with the utility agencies and as well with the with the general public. And I think that's one of the commissions that uh, is one of the most difficult, you know, you, there's, you can't please everyone. But, uh, you know, I thank you for all the, the effort and time that you, you put into the commission, and, you know, especially you being uh, very busy to begin with, you know, and being an attorney and on. And, um, it's just amazing how you can balance the time to to handle both and uh, the work that you do doesn't go unnoticed. I, and I think uh, that goes so, as well for the media. They, they you know, they don't, uh, they don't let a day go by when uh, the, the PUC comes out with uh, one decision or the other. 
but you know, thank you guys for all the effort and work that you put into it. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions. I just look forward to voting on uh, his nomination and getting him reconfirmed to, to the board once again. Thank you, sir. Mr. Penglin, and thank you again for your time and your, your uh, efforts that you put onto the board and you have my, my support and my vote for your nomination again. Thank you very much, Senator Atta. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Senator Atta. Senator Tidegui, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. Good morning, Fred. Thank you for your testimony and being here today, as always. Uh, you've been the uh, pillar of uh, PUC and providing information and doing your due diligence as well. I wanna thank you as well, Mr. Recchi, for all the work you're doing at PU PUC. Um, you're always there, thank you. Mike, we've known each other for a long time in a different capacity as a musician, you know, and um, this is your third term, 12 years already sitting on PUC. That's quite a long time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, you plan on doing it a fourth time, but uh, I know that the experience that you have is going to be very helpful. The institutional knowledge is something that's lacking in so many areas. Um, I'm sure you bring that as well as Mr. Hareki, who's been there. Uh, any kind of history report, I just have to ask him. And, and he's like an encyclopedia. But um, of course it needs people like you on the board who um, I, I believe, I know you, I've known you, have spoken to each other. You, you have a great disposition. Um, I, I think you're very level-headed, um, especially if you get people coming to the PUC with complaints about uh, P, uh, GPA or GWA, especially if they receive a bill, like a water bill that's astronomical, you know, next thing you know, they've been trying to fight with Waterworks to say, no, there's no leak on our side. There's nothing been, you know, an issue on our side. And why are you guys billing me this amount without, you know, somebody there uh, to make sure that I'm there when you're doing inspections, things like that. I'm sure it comes your way. And as an attorney, uh, it's very helpful to hear both sides of the story, you know. Um, I mean, the next step for you in your profession is to be a judge. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to have your, your experience and background. Um, but because you're a very popular law firm, has there any, been any conflict of interest at all that where you had to step aside on, on issues when it comes to PUC? Thank you, Senator Tidegley, uh, for that question. And also thank you for the active role that you also played in PUC matters. We've, we've, we know that you have paid a special attention to a lot of the, the functioning and the operations, of the PUC and the utilities. And we appreciate that as well. Now, that's an excellent question. And that's one of the most challenging aspects of kind of having an attorney on the commission, because we have gr a great team of lawyers that provides advice to us, like Fred and, and uh, Joe Fitt and, and Tony. Um, but as a PUC commissioner, you know, I have to constantly avoid any um, conflicts of interest. And so what, what, so what I've always done is that anytime I have a client, and I, it, once in a while it does arise, um, where a client of mine um, comes before the PUC, usually not, because most of my clients are uh, private sector and not, um, you know, utility agencies, but I have a few telecom clients because the PUC does, so has uh, oversight of, of uh, telecom companies. And in, the, in once in a while, I'll have a client that will file a petition. And in, in every time that happens, I um, recuse myself and don't participate in the matter. And I also don't advise the client in the matter that, that they're uh, pursuing that might become the, before the PUC. And one particular example recently, though, that you know, it's kind of a, as one that a lot of people know about is the Kepco power plant. That is a client of our firm. And so unfortunately I've had to not be involved in any PC matters involving Kepco because of the fact that lawyers in my firm advise Kepco um, in matters that come before us. I don't advise Kepco directly because of the fact that I'm, I sit on the PC, but, um, but I have to recuse myself from that. And that's, you know, that's, I regret that because I, you know, it's an important issue and I obviously want to contribute, but it's also important to avoid any conflict or even appearance of conflict. So I, I'm always careful to do that. And thankfully it hasn't happened other than Kepco. It hasn't really happened as much in the past couple of years where I've had to step away from a, an agenda item. 
uh, or a docket item, but it does happen from time to time. And it's um, really important that, I, that I'm strict about it because it's, right. we have, I have a professional responsibility, not only as a, you know, as a commissioner under the government ethics code, but also as an attorney under the attorney professional rules to avoid any conflicts. And thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you for answering my second question with regards to the solar issue and, and what the PUSA play, plays a part in. Um, I guess uh, we're just watching that as, as it unfolds. Um, with the end report that's required to the legislature, you know, to the governor as well as the speaker uh, by the end of the year, um, does it reflect, um, Mike or even Fred, if you want to answer this, uh, does it reflect any uh, conflict of interest where um, members of the PUC uh, have to step step aside because of conflict? Is that is that included in the annual report when situations happen like this? Mike, would you like me to answer that? Sure. Okay. Uh, no, not generally. It is reflected in our minutes. Of course, we have written minutes uh, of every meeting that are posted electronically, and uh, those reflect um, when, whenever a commissioner uh, disqualifies himself or herself uh, from a particular matter. The annual report uh, does not. Basically, the annual report is a summary of the matters that we cover each year. And I'm usually uh, quite involved in the preparation of the annual report. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, basically goes over each docket that we have covered and what were the main items discussed and decided. But in that presentation, we, we don't get down to the level of uh, which commissioner di were, was disqualified in any matter. Okay, well, thank you so much for that, Fred. Um, also, Fred, what, what funds the PUC? What, what funds your office, this office? Okay, the, the, the PUC is funded by the utilities. So every year, the, uh, the commission, normally in its uh, September meeting before the start of the new fiscal year, prepares a budget. And we're talking now a budget for the, um, the administrative budget for the operations of the PUC. And basically the PUC comes up with a budgeted amount and then that is divided among each of the regulated entities. So let's say for example, normally the administrative budget is pretty, pretty set at around, uh, I would say $500,000 or so. And then that, that amount is, is divided up by the utilities and they're, they're now I think of, uh, at least five utility groups so so the amount would be divided and each each either utility telecom is is a group so they for telecom the amount is divided internally among the different companies but but generally it runs probably somewhere from 90 to 100,000 per utility per year that's the administrative budget okay. then regulatory matters are handled in a different matter those are in the dockets where a utility brings a petition or a matter, then um, the particular consultant working on that matter will submit a bill to the utility. That's called the regulatory budget. And there's, you know, that varies, of course, depending on the amount of work that the utilities require. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I was always wondering about that. Of course, that has to be approved by the commission, you know, that budget. Yes. The commission is yes. scrutinized and, okay, so it's about $500,000 that runs this agency. The administrative uh, okay. portion to fund the PUC operations. Okay, well, thank you. That's that's my last question. And and Mike, you know, uh, <coughs> you only have my support. You know, I, I wish you the very best. Uh, my office is open and I, I hope the same goes when I come knocking on your door as I've done in the past <laughs> with any questions, but uh, I continue to, uh, um, see the work that you're doing and ensuring that it that your work is in the best interest of the people of Guam. And I hope you Thank keep you. at the forefront. Thank you, okay. Thank you so much, Senator Tidegui. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Senator Brown, you're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and certainly thank you to Mr. Pangolin for once again stepping up to the plate to uh, accept a renomination back to the PUC. I did want to ask currently, how many years have you served uh, with the PUC now? Good morning, Senator Brown. Um, I've served now 12 years. This would be my third 
uh, renomination. And, and gosh, with all that, those years of experience, you've certainly seen many petitions come before you. And certainly the time I was in the Port Authority, we, we were also there with regards to our bonds and our rate, rate uh, issues. Uh, moving forward, though, with, with uh, how do you see things in terms of your role and what you can add or contribute or perhaps even what you want to see improved? Is there anything with regards to the process of the work that the commissioners are doing? I mean, now we certainly have the, you know, the adjustment are happening with the construction of a new power plant and of course rates are always coming before you to in most cases continued increases of rates um, so with the wealth of years of experience that you've had how do you see your role now and is there more you'd like to shift or adjust moving forward with regards to your participation or even the direction of where the PUC is going uh, now that you certainly have all that additional uh, time and experience under your belt so to speak well, that's, that's an excellent question, Senator Brown. I, um, I definitely see my role as continuing to contribute in any way I can, of course. My, mm -hmm. um, as, as Mr. Hurecki pointed out earlier, my contributions tend to be in, focused on um, contract review and in, in, in ways that I, we can find ways to accomplish um, goals of the utilities um, within the law and making sure that we're in compliance. One, one thing that's happened um, recently that really hasn't um, occurred throughout most of the time I've been on the PUC is our oversight over the Guam Solid Waste Authority. Um, that's kind of that's an agency that we have oversight over, which is now become um, you know it's no longer in receivership. It's now in a it's trying to accomplish certain goals that have been put in place by this by, by an audit that we had done um, last year by, by one of our consultants where they looked at the solid waste authorities operations and tried to recommend ways that they can be self-sustaining and, and can um, continue their operations in an efficient way. And one of the things that I think is a big challenge that we're going to face that I've been thinking about a lot is whether or not the Guam Solid Waste Authority should be um, a mandatory. In other words, trash collection should be mandatory. That everyone has to has to have it. Um, you know, as a way to increase revenues and as a way to prevent sort of that. You know, the problems that we face with the illegal dumping. But mm -hmm. the challenge with that, and it, and it's because it's I'm I'm fascinated by it because it's hard to accomplish a mandatory trash collection um, regime because the question of how to enforce it. How would you enforce that? I mean, with power and water, you, you know, everybody has to pay their power bill, otherwise they'll get cut off. They have no choice. And there's a, there's a mechanism to kind of compel people to pay their bills. Now, how do you do that with trash collection where you, um, if a person doesn't want to sign up for service, but they're forced to, you know, if they don't sign up for service, what happens? You take away their trash can, but they don't want their trash can. So, I mean, it, there's no uh, motivation to uh, continue and there's not much, and it's really hard to come up with a mechanism for enforcement. And that came up recently for us. And as we thought through it, you know, we're still in the process of trying to think about what, how do you do that? How do you actually uh, accomplish that? But that's something that I think would improve, would improve the lives of people in Guam uh, if we could, we could find a way to kind of um, solve that issue. That's, that's just an example. Things like that are what I, what I um, focus on um, more challenging aspects that are kind of outside of the normal operation, but in ways that we can help improve people's lives in Guam. Well, I certainly appreciate that response. I mean, one of the ways actually, I think that that could be addressed is really regulatory because Guam EPA has that ability um, is, is uh, you know, making sure residents have verification of how they're addressing disposal of their waste. Uh, be it through the, you know, if they're not doing it directly through solid waste and if they're, you know, taking it themselves to the transfer station, they've got to have a receipt to show that they have properly disposed of their waste because we all generate it every day. So I, that's just another option to look at because certainly I understand what you're saying. You know, I, I, we wish everyone was responsible in our community, but obviously that's not the case. And uh, on occasion, you know, we have to use regulatory enforcement to address compliance. But I appreciate your insight and, and the fact that you desire to continue to serve. I mean, there's only a select few, but over the years that have been able to sit on the PUC and, and, and essentially have a lot of that uh, uh, experience and know-how and uh, have, have, you know, been there for a long time. And it looks like you're on track to doing exactly that. Uh, but that's beneficial, certainly, because you do have the history that you bring to the table and experience. And we definitely want those set of eyes looking and, and making sure that even as we're addressing rate increases,
they're addressing compliance with the department or agencies that you oversee uh, that is all, all ultimately in the best interest of the public. So thank you so much for your, your continued service and we wish you well on your, your service and continued work that you're doing at the PUC and certainly hi to Fred. I don't get to see him as often, but good to see you again and happy holidays to all of you. And it's nice to have a pleasant hearing. We don't get to do that all the time, but uh, at least we get to do it uh, this morning with uh, Mr. Pangolinan's confirmation. So with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions and, and receive responses. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Thank you, Senator Brown. Okay, Mr. Pangolinan. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank you for all the hard work you've done. Uh, I, I'm sure you've been many uh, hours into um, into the Public Utilities Commission, uh, considering you've been uh, on the commission for um, two terms, right? And now this would be your third term. Is that correct? That's right, Mr. Chairman. So throughout your time, have you had any uh, difficulty attending any of the PUC meetings since your initial appointment? I have, I've met, missed a few, um, Mr. Chairman, um, but most of the time it's if I'm, if I'm off island. Um, I've actually tried to advocate to, for, to, for a rule change that would allow me to attend virtually if I am off island, but it's something that hasn't been put in place yet. I think uh, as a commission, we've generally met in person. And even all of our meetings have been in person, even through the pandemic, you know, we've taken great pains to kind of make that happen. But there are times when I'm off island um, and I can't attend. But uh, and it, if there's a very, very important matter, um, you know, where there's a scheduling conflict, then um, I'll, you know, I'll have to not attend. But I, I do check in to make sure that we have a quorum and that my, if I don't attend, it's not going to affect, you know, the outcome or prevent the PUC from functioning. But generally speaking, um, I, you know, I attend almost every meeting. Okay. Could you explain uh, what roles the administrative law judge plays when a docket is established for any of the entities under the PUC's regulation? Well, the administrative law judge um, manages the docket and depending on the nature of the request, uh, the Administrative law judge will, will do the initial review, um, will request information from the parties presenting and, and um, do an initial analysis. If, the, if there needs to be advice from a consultant, the administrative law judge can take input from the consultant. If it's a docket matter that requires um, public comment, the administrative law judge will set up um, dates and locations of public hearings and conduct the public hearings uh, so that public can show up and give comment on the matter, and then eventually generate a report, um, an ALJ report that goes to the commissioners with a recommendation um, for, for uh, you know, a decision on a matter that's before it. So it's, it kind of depends on the docket as to the details of how that process works out, but it's but generally administrative law judge handles the review and the analysis um, and, and provides a recommendation and then ask the commissioners to take action at a meeting. So aside from uh, this sort of uh, recommendation from the administrative law judge, do the commissioners receive any briefings from staff on dockets before uh, the commission um, has a monthly meeting? Yes, the commission receives, it can be an administrative law judge report and at times, um, sometimes it'll be a legal counsel report we have, um, you know, like, as I mentioned, a good team of lawyers, the three attorneys and ALJs that we have on our staff um, provides a report a few days before, at least a few days before the upcoming meeting, any item that is on the agenda will be put into a binder of material that, that we have to review to prepare for the, the meeting. We get the agenda, you know, maybe a week or two before the meeting so that we know what's coming and then we get the binder of all the material that's been submitted a few days before the meeting, because sometimes material is submitted, especially if it's an urgent matter, it may be submitted a little bit close to the hearing. So they, they don't, they, they want to give us the most up-to-date information before, they, before the, the, uh, the meeting. Okay. And the five years you've sat as a commissioner, I'm sorry, five, it's, more than five years, right? Does any procedure, policy, or practice stand out as needing improvement in your mind or expansion of any 
procedure or policy or practice? Well, that's an excellent question. I, as I mentioned it earlier, I think that as we get, as we've learned sort of through the COVID pandemic, you know, it's really important to be able to function um, even if you cannot be physically in one place together, all, all commissioners. So I personally feel that it would be a good idea to have a rule change that adds the um, possibility of virtual meetings um, so that not so much because we can't meet um, because it, you know, we need it in order to actually have our meetings, but just so that all commissioners can always participate because there are times when we travel not only for work, but also even for training and cannot always be at a meeting. And it would be better to have as many commissioners as possible to attend just to get more input. So if we could implement a, a process that allows remote um, attendance at meetings, I think that that would be an improvement. Okay. What attributes would you recommend an appointee possess to make them an effective commissioner? Well, I think that it, would, it helps to have, to be a part of the community, either, you know, have some experience as in business or in, with a government agency um, and, and to have been fami familiar with sort of how business and um, commercial activity and, and government works on Guam. So if you're brand new to Guam and you're not familiar with how, how anything, things operate here, I think that that would be a, a drawback. I think it should be somebody who's, a, who's in the business community or in the um, or part of the government, um, has some government experience. That, those, that would be one sort of background um, attribute. But I also think that just somebody that has um, some patience and, and is not so, um, doesn't have a difficulty dealing with people or dealing with difficult issues. Um, somebody that has that is reasonable and rational, because I think that because the, with the amount of information that we have to um, process, you know, sometimes really the answer is just what's the right thing to do in this situation. And even with all the technical information you have, you still have to make sure you come out with a fair result. So if you're too lost in the details and you're not looking at the big picture, then I think that that's. Um, you know, that's going to get in your way. So somebody that has a level head, rational, um, has some has experience in business or in, in government. Um, I think that those are important um, aspects and important attributes to have as a commissioner. You mentioned the technical details and, uh, you know, you're dealing with uh, utilities uh, that have highly technical reports, so to speak, when they're making presentations, uh, even if they think that they're putting it in layman's terms as best as possible. Do you find it difficult sometimes to digest all the information that they're submitting to the commission? I do find it difficult. I, um, I try to read all of the documents that are submitted, but what I focus on the most is the reports that are sort of digested in advance by the ALJs and the legal and our legal counsel. And so what, you know, they always submit us a summary, submit to us a summary and an analysis that they've done where they've kind of tried to look through some of the, you know, the volumes of information and, and pull out the most important elements and the things that are actually most relevant to our decision. And so then they submit that along with the volume of material. On top of it, you'll see their summaries and you'll see um, that are with citations to the places that we need to look and focus on. So, so as difficult as it is to digest, it definitely helpful um, to have a team of people that helps you do that. And that's, you know, that's why I appreciate our ALJ so much and, uh, and rely on them a lot. Okay. Um, according to your, the packet you submitted, it looks like your last uh, ethics and government training was in 2015. Is that correct? Yes. Unfortunately, it's been, it has been a few years. If so, I believe the law requires a, a refresher course by now. I think your refresher course is probably due in 2019. I apologize for that, Mr. Chairman. I um, realized that I was due for a refresher. I had, uh, wasn't aware of the requirement. That's no excuse. I mean, but um, you know that how how often I had to have it done. 
you know, time flies at 2015 is kind of a long time ago, but it doesn't seem like it feels like I just took that course recently, but I will sign up for the next time it's offered and make sure I get that, get that uh, requirement satisfied. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to make sure that uh, you're up to date with the ethics and government training. Um, okay. I would like to point out a couple of things, uh, beginning with the Public Utilities Commission's enabling legislation. So in the enabling legislation, excuse me, enabling uh, law, it's uh, 12 GCA, chapter 12, uh, that's section 12102.1, Ratepayers' Bill of Rights. And I'm gonna read from B. Now in B it says, while the legislature in Guahan recognizes that over a long period of time, an increase in utility rates is inevitable. Such rate increases must be made out of absolute necessity and only after every cost cutting effort has been made and every other available option has been exhausted. So with that in mind, my question for you as a commissioner, uh, do you believe that you guys have been able to satisfy that section of the law that requires that rate increases are only made out of absolute necessity and only after every cost cutting effort has been made and every other available option has been exhausted. Mr. Chairman, I do believe that we have satisfied that. I think that we take any rate increase very seriously and, and we definitely don't want to increase rates or approve rate increases. I think that we always spend a lot of time um, reviewing any request for a rate increase that and think and factor in all of the, the possible impact and, and try to find ways to around it. We look for other options of to if, if it's a if it's a revenue issue because there needs to be something funded for to for a capital improvement project or to keep the utility infrastructure equipment running properly or to satisfy you know a court order or or or, or legislation or laws that require utilities to convert their their generation to different types of energy sources. There's a lot of requirements that have to be met, that have to be funded, and there's there needs to be revenue to fund it. And so we've we always look for all the different possibilities, whether we can take it from their you know the utilities insurance money and apply that to offset the cost so that we don't have to do a rate increase. We considered you know whether or not to even raise the you know the the LIAC rate. You know, if we have to, if we, the impact that it has on, on consumers sometimes prevents us from, from raising rates that really need to be raised because we don't want to negatively affect, um, you know, affect rate payers. We've definitely not, we've resisted the um, request to raise rates at times when we just feel that there's, it's just too much of an impact, even if it's absolutely necessary. So it's just, you know, we, we take it case by case. But every time that I've voted on a rate increase, I've always come to the conclusion in my own mind that there is no other option and that we have explored all other available um, alternatives before I would, I would vote in favor of it. And then, you know, of course, the reason I ask that is, uh, you know, our office and I'm sure many other senators' offices field a lot of uh, complaints about utility rates in general. Um, of course, the most recent rate increases are to Guam Power Authority. So we have constituents coming to our office um, complaining about their power bill. And uh, sometimes they think that they're being improperly billed. Um, but I think most of the time they just don't realize that the rates were increased. So a lot of times we end up telling them, uh, we even look at all their paperwork and help them sort of sort through it. And we end up telling them, um, no, sir, uh, your rates went up. That's why you're paying more. Because a lot of times they come and they say, oh, I used to pay this last year. Last, for the last several years, I've been paying this. Why am I paying this now? And we have to tell them, you know, the rates went up. And, you know, I'm sure you're well aware of 
the strain that the utility rates have put on the community and how it not only impacts individual rate payers, but it impacts the community as a whole. It impacts the economy as a whole. And in fact, this is pretty much recognized in the enabling act for the PUC. There's other sections here that talk about how, you know, residents have very little choice in purchasing these basic necessities. They are held captive to the rates and rate increases of the public utilities. Any rate increase therefore diminishes the amount of hard earned wages residents have to spend on other basic necessities such as food, shelter, and clothing, as well as the amount of hard earned wages they have to set aside for retirement, college, emergencies, or family business. This is in the enabling act for the PUC. So this is something that was thought about uh, many years ago uh, in this act. And it's something I think that we're seeing happening now with uh, high utility rates. Um, they're much higher than they were when this act was enacted. I think this was in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm sure if I look at what the rates were back in 2004, and what the average household was paying was probably a lot less. I remember it being a lot less. So the reason I bring all this up is because this is one of the primary responsibilities of the PUC. And I just wanna be sure that uh, you are aware of the importance and you've stated that you are, but I guess I just want to reiterate the importance of really, really thinking about the rate payers. So I know it's, you have a lot to balance and a lot to weigh. You have utilities agencies that come before you. And of course they're requesting for rate increases because they, they'll make presentations that are highly technical oftentimes saying why they need to increase rates uh, for various reasons. Um, and I'm sure they essentially try to say that they need to increase the rates in order to stay afloat, in order to keep an operation. Um, but I just want to be sure that you think about the ratepayers first and foremost every time you make these decisions, because we have reached a point now where I think it is becoming extremely difficult for people to keep up with the rates for their utilities. And as is pointed out here in the Enabling Act, uh, this diminishes the amount of money they have to spend on other things, which in turn impacts the economy locally because as you're, I'm sure you're well aware, if people have less uh, money to spend on other things, then they're not going out and spending it in, in the economy and in local businesses and supporting local businesses here on Guam. And it also, of course, affects each business on Guam because uh, each business on Guam also has to pay their own power and water utilities. And I've heard from many different businesses over the years about the difficulty they have in paying their power and water bills and how uh, when water rates and power rates increase, they often have no choice but to pass that increase onto their customers by increasing their prices of their products and services. So I just wanted to really highlight that and just really drive that message home that I hope you're, you keep that in mind every time you think about rates and that you scrutinize to the best of your ability any request for rate increases, uh, as well as any contracts that come before you um, for, that the utilities are looking to have approved by the PUC uh, because contracts result in costs. So is the cost of that contract going to increase the cost to rate payers? Now, those are things I really, really hope that the commission takes extremely seriously and I hope you guys will look at that. And it does lead me to a, my next point, which is of a little bit of a concern uh, that I'm glad you addressed openly and honestly earlier in this meeting, uh, in this hearing, excuse me, was that um, you've had to recuse yourself um, from decisions dealing with KEPCO. Uh, now KEPCO, are, they have major contracts. So the, the discussion we were having in this hearing earlier focused primarily on the solar contract. However, uh, KEPCO, that's not the only contract KEPCO has uh, with the Guam Power Authority. In fact, they have a much larger contract as I'm sure you're aware, which is the Ukudu uh, baseload generation. And of course, they're now looking to have another generator built down in Cabris as a part of that contract, uh, which uh, is huge. And I believe uh, if all these things are built, KEPCO will be the single largest 
private power producer for the Guam Power Authority. In fact, I think they'll be producing roughly half of the utilities uh, capacity for power generation, uh, if not more. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head right now, but last time I looked at it, it's about half and they'll be the largest power producer. So when you're having to recuse yourself from any decision-making involving what is going to be or what is currently the largest private power producer for the Guam Power Authority, that is of concern um, because that means you're not able to weigh in on any of those decisions and you're not able to, as I mentioned earlier, consider the rate payer first when the Utilities Commission is approving of these contracts because you can't even vote on the approval of that contract for KEPCO. So you've had to take yourself out of that and leave it up to other commissioners. So that is of some concern um, to me. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How has that affected your ability to be a commissioner um, with the relationship your law firm has with KEPCO? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand the concern and because it is a concern because there is, it's inappropriate for me to serve on a, on a commission and make decisions and have input onto a matter that involves a client that lawyers in our firm are advising. So for that reason, it's just, it's important that I not participate in that and that I rely upon the other six commissioners um, to, you know, to make the decisions and to weigh the, the you know, the, the rate payers, um, the impact on rate payers, as you've, as you've definitely um, clearly pointed out and very well pointed out, which I completely agree with. And I, I agree with everything you said about how important it is to consider the impact that, that these rates, that any sort of rate changes have on rate payers. Because that's, that is the most important, most, most important concern and most important function. But for the purposes of, of the KEPCO issue, you know, there's just no, um, it's in, totally inappropriate for me to be involved in that. You know, sim, in a, going back to the question about, you know, the ethics in government, I mean, that's one of the fundamental rules of ethics in government is that you don't involve yourself in a decision in, a, in an issue where you might, you know, you have some other sort of interest. And so if my law firm is advising a company before us, before the commission, then I definitely should not be involved in and, and providing any input. But I don't think that impacts my ability to function as a commissioner. Yes, maybe on that, on that issue. And yes, you're right, it's absolutely, it's a major issue. It's a big, um, important item that the PUC is dealing with right now. So I am sort of not, act, not active and not available on that issue. But there are plenty of other, way, other issues on the docket and other issues that come before the commission that I can contribute in. And I, so I don't think that that eliminates my value, although it does eliminate my input on that important issue. Would you be able to vote on a request for a base load, uh, base rate increase, uh, considering that uh, the largest base load generator uh, once completed, the Ukudu power plant will be owned by Kepco, a company that um, you'd have to recuse yourself from. I I'm not sure how that would affect that. Is that something you would see that you wouldn't be able to vote on because it's a base rate increase caused by perhaps the cost of base load generation by the KEPCO power plant? Well, you know, on that issue, I would probably ask for some input from our legal counsel um, just to tell me what sort of advice they have on that. I, the way I look at um, my recusals is that if the entity that my law firm represents is not coming before us for any request, they don't have any pending issue, they're not um, involved in asking for any change or any sort of um, relief from the PUC that I generally don't recuse myself unless the entity is actually a petitioner or involved in a request. So the fact that there may be an entity that now operates the generate their generation facility, um, I don't believe that that disqualifies me from having any input on rates going forward because of that, because of there, yes, yes, there is going to be some, they are affected by it that, you know, KEPCO is affected by it, but I don't think that the fact that, that they're the, the operating the generators 
generation facilities is going to disqualify me from any further rate involvement. Okay, thank you. Well, I appreciate uh, your time this morning, Mr. Pangolin, and thank you for answering the questions. Uh, thank you for uh, appearing before us today. And I'd like to thank my colleagues as well. And, uh, and thank you, Mr. Pangolin, for, uh, as my, some of my colleagues stated earlier, for stepping up to the plate, uh, so to speak, for serving on the commission. Um, and I appreciate your comments this morning and your testimony this morning. And I just, again, ask you, as I said earlier, but I will keep reiterating it <laughs> as many times as I can to please think about the rate payers whenever you're making these decisions. Um, with that, if uh, there are no other comments from any of my other colleagues or any closing comment that you would like to make Mr. Pangolin and you can do so at this time. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to thank you um, again for asking the tough questions and, and um, focusing on rate payers and the concerns of the public and protecting the people of Guam, which I also share your concerns and definitely will keep in mind everything that you said going forward. I want to thank Senator Ada, Senator Brown, and Senator Tidegley for, for your participation and for your support as well. Thank you, Mr. Hareki, too, for, for your support and for everything you, you've done for the commission. Thank you all and Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Pangolinen. Uh, if there are no uh, further questions or comments, this will conclude our discussion on the appointment of Mr. Pangolinen to the Public Utilities Commission. We will recess for five minutes before we proceed with discussions on the appointment of Mr. Al Edric LeBang as a youth member of the Board of Directors of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. And yes, Merry Christmas, everyone, and happy holidays, and have a happy new year if I don't uh, speak to you again. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.
Uh, Afade, good morning. Uh, this virtual public hearing will now reconvene for the committee to hear and accept testimony on the appointment of Mr. Al Edrich LeBang as youth member of the Board of Directors of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. And we'll begin uh, by uh, some testimony that I will read into the record from the Director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities, uh, Sandra Flores. Uh, good morning, Senator Brown. Good morning, uh, Mr. LeBang. I apologize. Good morning to you both. Uh, good morning, Senator Tidegui. All right. Uh, I'll begin now by reading a testimony provided by uh, Sandra Flores, Director of Guam Council on Arts and Humanities. She apologizes. She was online with us earlier this morning uh, because of the length of the first hearing. She wasn't able to stay online for this hearing. She has something else uh, that she has to attend to at this time. Uh, so uh, I will go ahead and read her testimony into the record. Half a day. This is Sandra Flores, Director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities. I would appreciate the statement being presented at the legislative confirmation hearing for Mr. LeBang as youth representative for a Guam Kaha Board of Directors. Guam Kaha as our government arts agency is mandated to provide art, the promotion of art and opportunities to appreciate art to our community. As such, we welcome a youth representative such as Mr. LeBang to bring us the perspective of the younger community. In looking at Mr. LeBang's biography and accomplishments, I am especially excited to welcome this appointment. Mr. LeBang has shown himself to be a leader in the Youth Congress as the vice speaker. He has worked in Washington as a legislative aide. This, I believe, gives him an appreciation of the federal support that Kaha receives and perhaps a better understanding of our vital partnership with the federal government. Mr. LeBang is also studying to become a teacher. I am impressed by this commitment to the future of our young people. In summary, I believe Mr. LeBang's history and accomplishments as well as his current area of study will be assets to the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Board and I welcome his confirmation. Okay, now again, that was testimony provided by the director of uh, CAHA, Sandra Flores. And at this time, I'll call upon the nominee, Mr. LeBang, to provide his testimony. Good morning, Mr. LeBang. You may Good proceed. Goodison, half a day, Senator Rigel, and members of the 36 Guam Managed Nature. I am Al LeBang, an immigrant from the Philippines who lived, for Guam, who lived in Guam for the past 12 years. Our Guam community has adopted my family and I and has provided me with many opportunities that I could never have imagined. Guam will always have a special place in my heart and I'm committed to doing anything to serve our island. I have been elected to the Guam Congress for the last six years where I represent and serve the youth of our island. Being appointed to the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency Board is another opportunity to re reciprocate the goodwill and embrace our local community that has given my family and I. I would like to thank Governor Lee Leon Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio for the opportunity to serve our people and the youth of our island on the Caja Board. As a board member for the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency, I plan to represent the youth of our island and promote youth artists who wish to preserve Guam's culture and heritage for the future to come. As part of the board, I will offer the youth of our island a voice in the Kaha board and reach out to the youth artists who promote their works and help them in their artistic journeys. As part of the board, I will bring the unique perspective offered by the youth in making decisions for the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities. As future teachers, as future teacher of this island, I wish to inspire the future of our island, the youth, to not be afraid to show their talents not only in our island, but also around the world. Senators, I humbly ask and respectfully ask for your support for my vocation to serve my adoptive island, which provided me with plenty of opportunities in life. I look forward for the legislature's favorable decision and I'm ready to serve wherever I need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBang. 
Uh, at this time, I'll open it up to my colleagues to ask questions or make any comments uh, or ask any questions they may have. Senator Brown, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Certainly appreciate uh, Mr. LeBang accepting an appointment, certainly at his very young age and wanting to serve. Uh, and of course, appropriate because he's a uh, position he'll be serving as a youth member to the board. But I wanted to ask him in terms of his own creativity, uh, what, what made him interested in wanting to serve on this board? Is he artistic by nature? Uh, what would, certainly Mr. LeBang, what, what would you like to see as your contribution with regards to our, our, our council in the arts and humanities here on Guam? What do you think you can add to the table beyond just your youthful energy that you're going to bring in perhaps insight? Are you yourself artistic? Is there more that you would like to see improved for our community here? Um, I'm going to get your thoughts on that. Thank you for that, Senator. So in terms of that, I'm not really a good singer or dancer, but I like blogging. So I do certain blogs and I wish to promote that here on our island as well. And that is something that I think the new art is, is like, you know, showing people through videos, through YouTube and everything, like through social media around our island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anything else you would like to think you could contribute perhaps to improve anything with regards to the work that, uh, is, is that occurs at Kaha? Is there something more you'd want to see to benefit the community that you believe you can bring to the table? I think um, my position as a future educator, I think, you know, bringing the arts through our schools, supporting more artists in within our school system, because I know there's a lot of youth who really want to pursue art. And often they would leave our island and, you know, it's sad that they will do it somewhere else where they can do it here in our island. Well, that, that's certainly a very good point. Uh, is this your first time to serve on a, you know, on a council like this? Or have you served on other, any other boards or commission or would this be your first time to serve on a council like, uh, like Kaha? I used to be appointed to the state advisory group for, for the Department of the Youth, so DYA. <laughs> oh, okay. It's like my appointment to Kaha is my first time. Well, very nice. I mean, you're certainly adding to your resume at a very young age. I certainly wish you well and hope uh, hope we hear uh, some good things coming from your service to uh, to the Kaha board. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to be able to ask Mr. LeBang a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Tidegui, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, Mr. LeBang. Good morning. Uh, and thank you uh, as well for wanting to serve uh, in this capacity. I mean, contributing to the community. Uh, you said you've been on Guam for what, 12 years? Yes. 12 years. And um, in that 12 years, have, have you done anything uh, culturally, you know, to, to promote the culture? Um, have you, you know, gone to performances or, to try to understand the history of Guam? Um, especially when PASPAC happened a few years ago, I really went to most of the performances and observed how the culture of Guam and the Philippines are very similar. And it's very uplifting to see that there are a lot, there are a lot of cultural similarities between Guam and the Philippines. Well, what it, what are you going to do to you know make Kaha a, a better agency or um, bring more awareness other than blogging? Um, uh, what other means uh, do you want to contribute to Kaha to promote you know our culture through arts through dance? That's a good question, Senator. And for me, I think you should focus more on advertising art artists, and that is something that I want to bring into the Kaha board and you know, promote our artists, not only here in our island, but also like, you know, in the global stage. It said that you were a legislative aide in Washington, DC, is that correct? Um, yes, so um, last summer I was accepted to the APAC, so the Asia Pacific Admin Institute, Congressional Institute, where I've served under under Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy's office as a legislative intern. Okay. 
Well, that's good. And the interest in, in um, the government is important because sometimes you need that background in order to uh, make these agencies work. Mm -hmm. But um, so how many, uh, how long is this term for? Four years. Four years, okay. Okay, well, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you can do, you know, and this is a, a, a good step uh, toward if you wanna make a difference on this island and contribute to our community. You know, nothing more um, pleases me to see people from other islands or other uh, countries coming to the island and, and promoting our culture and keeping it alive and make sure it's sustainable, you know, for the, the next generation and the next after that to remind uh, what kind of people we are here on this island and where we came from. So I appreciate, you know, continuing to um, educate yourself on the culture of the island and, you know, from, from the very, very beginning, 4,000 years ago, you know, but we have a long, long history on this island, most than any other islands in the Pacific. So 4,000 years. So I appreciate, um, again, your willingness to serve the community and look forward to see what you have to offer. My door is all open, by the way, like mm -hmm. uh, Senator Rogel, we're just upstairs <laughs> from Paha. So we're not far away for you to come knocking on our door if you have any questions or what you would like to see uh, Kaha become or even in improve in any manner, or if there's any issues, you know, please, the door is always open. Thank you, Mr. LeBang. Thank you, Senator. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Okay, Mr. LeBang, uh, first of all, congratulations on your appointment and thank you for stepping up, especially at uh, such a young age, being willing to participate in your government and uh, its processes. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and the only real questions I have for you are just, uh, well, number one, uh, do you think that the arts on Guam are being supported? I think it is being supported, but I think it needs to be more promoted. It's like, you know, we need to just push more towards, like, you know, letting people know in our island that we have artists here on our island. And it's something that I want to help Kaha with. You mentioned uh, that uh, vlogging and sort of digital type of stuff. So is that uh, going to be your focus on how to promote the arts and culture um, through digital means? Um, yes. So this is something that I want to push forward is like, you know, through, you know, probably we can host like um, documentaries also like um the like small logs as well as just like you know social media is very powerful these days. Okay, um, and finally, what do you think could really be done um, by the government of Guam to really fully support the arts and the culture? I think it's more on like funding. I think for the artists as well. So it's like pushing them to pursue their art because like often um, the arts are often not, they're often neglected through school and like in the past we focus more on the STEM part. So it's something that we need to work on is the STEAM programs like, you know, including the arts as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. LeBang. Uh, thank you to my uh, colleagues for participating this morning. The committee will continue to accept written statements on today's hearing within 10 business days from today, which may be mailed to my office at 238 Archbishop Flores Street, Suite 906 of the DNA Building in Haganya. You may also send your statements to us at clintrogel at guamlegislature.org. That is spelled C-L-Y-N-T-R-I-D-G-E-L-L -L at guamlegislature.org or you can send it by fax to 475-4768. Thank you all for your participation and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and a Happy New Year to you all. This virtual public hearing is adjourned. It is 10, 18 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>